Human immunodeficiency viruses were first isolated in 1983 when they were identified as the causative agent of AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. The immunodeficiency lays patients open to infection with a range of pathogens which would normally be controlled by cell-mediated immunity. For example, individuals can develop infection of the mouth and other mucosal tissues with the fungus Canada or they can develop infections in the lungs caused by pneumocystis carinii. The pneumonia causes the patchy infiltration and consolidation seen on this chest x-ray. Some individuals develop abscesses caused by parasites such as toxoplasma, which you can see here on a brain scan produced by magnetic resonance imaging. In other cases, individuals can develop a cancer called Kaposi sarcoma, where endothelial cells lining blood vessels become transformed. This appears to be a consequence of uncontrolled infection with a herpes virus, which has the ability of transforming cells to induce uncontrolled malignant replication. So the infections which develop in AIDS are a consequence of immunodeficiency virus infection, but are not directly caused by the virus itself. In fact, AIDS is the end stage of an extended infection which may have developed many years previously and which progresses at different rates in different individuals. The human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, selectively attacks cells of the immune system, including CD4-positive T cells and mononuclear phagocytes. Immediately following infection, there is an acute illness lasting for one to four weeks, during which virus spreads in the blood, and the numbers of CD4 T cells are reduced. At this stage, the infection is controlled, but not before the virus has disseminated into many tissues of the body, including the lymphoid tissues and sometimes the brain. Over the following months and years, there is a progressive struggle between the immune system and the virus, with virus produced at high levels, but essentially controlled by lymphocytes and antibodies. However, as the disease progresses, there is a relentless decline in T-cell numbers, and once these fall to a sufficiently low level, the infections which are characteristic of AIDS start to develop. The seriousness of the AIDS epidemic can be seen in the progressive rise in the levels of infection since the virus was discovered, particularly in Africa. The map shows the prevalence of individuals with HIV-1-specific antibodies measured in 1998. There are two principal types of human immunodeficiency virus, HIV-1, the prime causative agent of the epidemic, and HIV-2, which is endemic to West Africa and appears to be less pathogenic. However, as we shall see, there is an enormous level of genetic variation within each of these strains. We will concentrate here on HIV-1. Take a look at the basic structure of the virus. The HIV-1 virus is enveloped in a lipid bilayer which has been derived from the infected cell. The envelope contains a number of virus proteins, including GP-41 and GP-120, which the virus uses to attach to host cell membranes. The core of the virus containing the single-stranded RNA genome is formed by P24 and this is surrounded by the matrix protein P17. The subscripts ENV and GAG indicate the viral gene which encodes that protein. Also contained within the virus core are a number of proteins required for the processing of viral RNA within the host cell. All of the viral genes are encoded within a single strand of RNA, just 10,000 bases long. HIV enters cells by attaching to CD4 molecules which are present on the cell membrane of target cells. The targets are principally T helper cells which express high levels of CD4, and mononuclear phagocytes and dendritic cells which express lower levels. This, however, is not the only factor involved. The virus must also use a co-receptor to get in. It turns out that the co-receptors belong to the class of cell surface receptors for chemokines, a group of cytokines involved in cell migration and activation. There are many chemokine receptors, and they are selectively distributed on particular cell populations. For example, the receptor called CXCR4 is present on T cells, while the receptor CCR5 is present on monocytes and macrophages. 
Different strains of the virus have adapted to use different co-receptors. So the macrophage-specific, or M-tropic strains, tend to use CCR5, while the lymphocyte-specific, or T-tropic strains, use CXCR4. The initial infection within a single individual is usually with a macrophage M-tropic strain, but as the disease progresses, genetic variation of the virus within that individual generates T-tropic strains as increasingly the lymphocytes become infected. This is not just of academic interest. A proportion of individuals, about 20% in Europe, have a mutated form of CCR5 which cannot be used by the virus as a co-receptor. Consequently, individuals who are homozygous for this mutation, that is, about 1% of the population, are less likely to become infected with HIV, and if they do become infected, the disease progresses more slowly. You can see this in the bar chart which shows the population frequency of the normal CCR5, the number of individuals who are heterozygotic, and the number who are homozygotic. The normal Caucasian population is shown in red, and individuals with HIV infection are in green. The CCR5 mutation is underrepresented in people with the infection. Interestingly, having the mutation does not appear to significantly impair the working of the immune system. Other mutations in chemokine receptor genes also appear to affect the rate of disease progression. Once inside a cell, the virus is uncoated and releases its genomic RNA, which is reverse transcribed by a viral enzyme ultimately producing double-stranded DNA, which can become incorporated into the nucleus of the infected cell as a provirus. It is worth noting that viral reverse transcriptase is a very sloppy enzyme, which introduces a high number of incorrect bases as it replicates the RNA. In other words, the rate of mutation of HIV is very high. If the provirus is activated, the proviral DNA is transcribed and genes for viral proteins are translated. The core and matrix proteins now assemble around the viral RNA to produce new virions, while envelope proteins are inserted into the host cell membrane. New virus is then produced by budding from the cell membrane. Infection with HIV induces both antibody responses and cytotoxic T cells. The cytotoxic cells recognize peptides derived from several of the different viral proteins. Naturally, the exact part of an antigen which is recognized depends on the way the antigen is processed and presented, which is largely determined by the MHC molecules present in each individual. An example is given of a peptide of the P24 antigen, which binds to the MHC class 1 molecule HLA-B27. The peptide of 10 amino acid residues is anchored to B27 via two residues indicated by the black arrows. Despite the potential variations in antigen presentation, some peptides such as this appear to be dominant in inducing immune responses, meaning that several different patients produce cytotoxic T cells which recognize the same segment of an antigen. However, as soon as an individual makes an immune response against a dominant epitope, it exerts selective pressure on the virus to mutate that region. This phenomenon is called virus escape. In the example, one patient developed a mutation in the arginine residue, which prevented it from binding to HLA-B27, so his cytotoxic T cells could no longer recognize virally infected cells. The mutant virus rapidly spread, and this was accompanied by a fall in the number of CD4 T cells and disease progression. Neutralizing antiviral antibodies develop relatively slowly after infection. Many of these antibodies are directed against specific peptide regions in the envelope protein GP120. The molecular model shows the GP120 envelope protein in dark blue with its associated carbohydrate units in yellow. Part of a CD4 molecule is shown in violet, and the binding site for CD4 on GB120 is clearly seen. 
The FAB arm of a neutralizing antibody is shown binding to a different area of GP120. The sites which bind antibodies are often highly variable between different isolates of HIV, even from a single individual, which has led to the idea that the neutralizing antibodies exert a strong selective pressure on the virus, favoring mutations. One problem with a highly mutable virus such as HIV is to sort out which mutations have occurred at random and which have been the result of selective pressure exerted by the immune system. It is possible to do this by distinguishing viral mutations which produce no change in the protein structure, so-called silent mutations, from those which do. If the numbers of such active mutations in a gene segment greatly exceeds the number of silent mutations, it implies that selective pressure has acted on the gene for that protein or that epitope, so that it avoids recognition by antibody. The high level of viral mutation and viral escape from immune control is the reason that it has been very difficult to devise an effective vaccine for AIDS. An effective immune response will exert selective pressure, favoring any virus which has mutated the epitope recognized by the immune system. Mutation and selection in HIV can be seen even in individual patients with AIDS. For example, when virus is isolated from different parts of the body of a single person, it is possible to construct phylogenetic trees which show the relationship between isolates from different organs. The phylogenetic tree shown here was constructed by sequencing the envelope proteins from 31 viral isolates obtained from one individual. The isolates came from different parts of the brain, monocytes, bone marrow, lymph nodes, and lung. It is interesting that the isolates from the white matter in the brain are similar to those in the monocytes and less similar to those in other parts of the brain, suggesting that the brain became infected from the blood on several occasions. The horizontal scale shows the percentage difference in sequence between branch points of the tree. It is also striking to see how the processes of mutation, diversification, isolation, and selection, which are the cornerstones of evolutionary biology, also occur during the development of pathogens in their battle with the immune system.